Okay, this is a recording for uh, Geology 2017. Uh, this will be a lab on uh, metamorphic rocks. Uh, so we are going to have a tour of a collection really of uh, different uh, metamorphic rocks uh, and uh, talk about uh, some of the critical aspects for the identification and recognition of different uh, types of metamorphic rocks. From the lecture, we have discussed the concept of a metamorphic grade and commonly the effect of, of uh, increases in grade, which corresponds usually to an increase in pressure and temperature. As a result of that, uh, if you remember also from the lab lecture, we learned that uh, we have usually the development of new mineralogy. So the first thing we, we are going to look at is uh, this mineral here. So remember that we have uh, uh, examples like this of metamorphic uh, minerals that will be found uh, often in uh, metamorphic rocks. Uh, this of course is a good example of a garnet. Uh, so certainly garnet, uh, staurolite, uh, and also the alumosilicates uh, such as uh, uh, andalusites, uh, silimanites, and, and chana okayanites will, will, will be uh, important to review. Okay, in, in addition to those, likely chlorite will be also a mineral that you will find uh, in some of the metamorphic specimens that, that we are going to talk about. Uh, and uh, probably other minerals that are of critical importance are other phyllosilicates. So often in uh, metamorphic rocks that derive from sedimentary rocks, we tend to find also quite a bit of phyllosilicates uh, and also clays. Uh, so we will find uh, in addition to chlorite, uh, quite a bit of muscovite, uh, biotite, uh, and also uh, very soft, uh, minerals such as talc as well as serpentine. So these are really the main metamorphic minerals of concern. And of course, in addition to those, you have all those other minerals that we already discussed extensively, such as feldspar quartz and so on. So in terms of sort of the mineralogy of these rocks, uh, you have to think at the precursor rock composition and also at the fact that in some cases you will produce uh, some of the metamorphic nesosilicates uh, such as garnet, which is a good example of this one. You, you see it's essentially a niquant mineral, very hard, reddish uh, in color, and so easy to spot and recognize in, uh, in metamorphic rocks. So we have an example of here of, of these uh, uh, Neisic assemblage, and you see clearly in this particular example, we have uh, some evidence of, of garnet in here. So there is a garnet, a garnet porphyroblast uh, yeah, present in this rock. So a porphyroblast uh, is essentially the equivalent uh, to what we call the phenocryst in a, an igneous rock or uh, usually a clast when we are talking about large clusters in, in sedimentary rocks. So, so when we deal with metamorphic rocks, many times we refer to these larger crystals in a fine, relatively fine grain matrix as being considered porphyroblasts. Okay, so remember this term porphyroblasts when you have very large crystals. And in this case, this is reddish in color, very hard. So usually above the 6.5, up to 7.5 and no cleavage uh, and usually rounded sections because it forms dodecahedron. So it's a nasosilicate and commonly very hard again, reddish in color. So easy to spot and recognize in metamorphic rocks. So many times when we talk about metamorphic rocks, we think at them similarly to the other uh, classifications uh, using texture and, and grain size many times. So what we are going to do is to have a tour of the specimens according to grain size. So we will start with relatively low grade, so low temperature, low pressure 
metamorphic rocks and move up progressively in grade and so increasing pressure and temperature as a result of that what we find commonly are a few things so the first thing is that the rock usually has tiny and very fine crystals when you are in the early stages of metamorphism so when you are metamorphosing a rock at very low pressure and temperature so during burial for example of a sedimentary rock this will result in very fine grain metamorphic rocks one example is, is uh, uh, this one here so you can see this rock is very fine grain very dark you don't see really a lot of minerals in this specimen. Uh, we can recognize some of the pre-existing laminations. So, so if you if you look carefully at this rock, you can see very tiny laminations uh, in, in the rock that indicates uh, the existence of bedded strata. So this was as a precursor for sure a, a sedimentary rock. You can see that also in here, uh, some, some of these fractures uh, uh, sort of resemble uh, some, some of the um, laminations that were present in this sedimentary rock. So of course, if you look at the color uh, and also the grain size, uh, uh, the fact that is, there is quite a bit of silica in this rock, uh, you could classify this easily as a shale. And so how do you tell the difference between a, a metamorphic rock and, and a sedimentary rock in this particular context? Um, so of course we would say it's low grade, but the difference is really on, on the presence of one critical aspect in these rocks, uh, which is commonly called cleavage. So cleavage is usually uh, generated by a number of processes, but okay, keep in mind that we have here some, some uh, uh, potential laminations. Uh, so if we turn this rock, uh, the fact that we can recognize other linear features like these. So here you see some, some clear lines on the top of the surface of this sample, which are orthogonal in terms of orientation with respect to uh, the I think now you can see them really well. So you can see a set of lines in here. And they have you know, an orientation, they form planes that have an orientation that is inconsistent really with the, with the bedding or lamination more correctly that we find on this part of the specimen. So this uh, fact, the fact that we can recognize two sets of planar features is uh, essentially a disting distinguishing factor between a sedimentary rock, which commonly has only what is called an S0. So uh, a, a compaction related uh, cleavage uh, and a rock that instead has uh, tectonic deformation that has occurred with a different orientation with respect to the, uh, in this case, planar strata. So if we have, you know, tangential uh, deformation. So we have uh, devi deviatoric stresses that develop quite often. Uh, they will have a different orientation with respect to the stratigraphy. So they will be not always orthogonal to stratigraphy, rather they will occur uh, with uh, a component that is parallel to the stratigraphy. And this commonly results in the development of high angle cleavage with respect to those strata so that's a key distinction many times we distinguish these rocks uh, which are called the slates uh, based also on the level of crystallization or recrystallization that occurs uh, in uh, some of these uh, um, clay minerals so there will be quite a bit of clay in this rock as well and uh, uh, quite often those are the minerals that get uh, um, uh, subject, I would say, to uh, effects of metamorphism which, and deformation, which we could, could call, for example, pressure solution. Uh, 
So in many cases, the compaction of the rock and further deformation tends to redistribute some of the quartz in the rock, as well as to reorganize essentially the uh, shape of some of the fill of silicates. So, so that's an important process that is occurring in metamorphic rocks. And this will occur at different levels. Uh, and often what you cannot really see in this rock because it's too fine grain is the concept of continuity of, of cleavage. Uh, so many times we tend to form uh, well-defined domains uh, in a metamorphic rocks uh, due to the partitioning of the formation. Uh, and this process usually leads to firstly formation of cleavage, subsequently formation of uh, schistosity, and also lastly formation of banding in metamorphic rocks. We saw that in the lab lecture. So in this case, we have initial domaining, but it's so tiny that is below the millimeter scale. So the, 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 the rock will look pretty much uh, continuous. And so uh, many times we talk about cleavage in these examples. Uh, okay, so remember if a rock doesn't shine a lot. So another feature that is important to, to look at is how much it shines. Uh, so many cases, uh, uh, the slate will be distinguished from a fill light based on the level of uh, recrystallization of, of some of the fill of silicates. So if we take an example of a fill light uh, and we compare it, uh, you can see in this case, firstly, we see much more green in this rock, uh, which is linked to the crystallization of one of the metamorphic mineral that I I've mentioned, which is called chlorite. So we tend to form chlorite. And you can see that if I move this specimen, uh, I can see much more crystallinity. And I start to see some of the small crystals that uh, are forming. So another important concept when we deal with metamorphic grade is the grain size. So the size of the crystals uh, that form uh, through uh, the recrystallization of the rock. Uh, so we change essentially the shape of the crystal and we get commonly larger crystals when, when we uh, form a, a fill light if compared to a slate. So that's, that's a critical distinction, but still this rock has uh, a, a reasonably fine grain. So, so it's not uh, really over the millimeter, see the crystals are very tiny, still very tiny. And so this is why uh, we tend to call these rocks fill lights. Uh, in some cases, you might have some porphyroblasts. Uh, so like this example here, it's uh, a porphyroblast uh, likely of either pyrote uh, or it could be garnet uh, that is uh, um, sort of trapped in the foliation. Uh, and in this case, the rock has uh, quite a bit of, of uh, cleavage, I would say. If I rotate this specimen, you can see uh, one of these porphyroblasts. And, and in this particular case, uh, I can say that this is pyrot because you can see the goldy luster. So met gold metallic luster is quite distinctive in, in, in this particular por porphyroblast. So again, uh, we can see really a, a fairly continuous cleavage in this case. Uh, so the rock has well-defined planes uh, and uh, we start to see also a bit of uh, irregularity, I would say in the distribution of these cleavage planes. They are not all planar. They start to have to certain certain extent uh, some bumps and uh, these irregularities in the cleavage surface are commonly related to the porphyroblast. So the fact that I have uh, in growth of uh, uh, some of these pyrot can condition the distribution of uh, uh, the uh, schistosity planes, uh, which are dominated by chlorite in this case. Uh, um, so remember, it's, it's a question of uh, how much the rock reflects uh, if you have a good amount of 
recrystallization and, and you form larger crystals, it will get uh, progressively more uh, reflective. Uh, so that's a big distinction. So when you find rocks like this, greenish, quite a bit of chlorite, very shiny, some, some initial formation of porphyroblasts uh, will, will certainly help you with the distinction between uh, a, a slate, uh, again, a slate is more dull, less reflective, uh, and mostly as uh, planar uh, cleavage. What happens if we increase further grade? Uh, we would move to more um, irregular examples like this. We have uh, a rock that has a foliation that is much more irregular, still uh, really abundant in uh, um, chlorite. So there is good abundance of chlorite, which is sort of helping with uh, uh, these greenish colors. We can identify quite clearly. So you can see. Uh, the greenish well, and you can see some, some porphyroblasts in here. And this one is quite brown to reddish. So definitely this would be an example of uh, garnet. So sometimes we have what are called spotted fill lights. Uh, and so you can see it's still quite fine grain uh, rock, uh, but as uh, much more porphyroblasts uh, and much more irregular. Uh, bedding in this case, uh, so you can see uh, if, if I um, trying to get a good angle. But yeah, the uh, foliation in this case, or, or more correctly, the cleavage is uh, starting to be more anastomosed. Uh, and as a function of that, uh, you are really moving uh, in a field that is between uh, a fill light and, and a schist, uh, basically. Sometimes fill lights will be also a different color. So they can be more grayish to black in, in color. And in this case, uh, we can see also a different type of porphyroblast. So in this case, we have that the rock is quite shiny. As you see, if, if I move it, uh, you can see all the tiny crystals of likely Muscovite and also biotite uh, that are quite uh, sort of um, reflective. Uh, so they reflect quite a bit of light. Uh, and this is related to uh, the perlaceous uh, luster or resinous uh, luster of uh, the biotite. Uh, but we have also very large porphyroblasts. Uh, they tend to be brown, dark brown to black. Uh, and they are uh, prismatic in habit uh, and usually have an hardness that is very high. So they go up to 7.5 in some cases. So, so many times you will see that these crystals form aggregates like this example here, we have an aggregate of multiple uh, dark prismatic uh, crystals uh, or in some other cases we form cross cross twins, uh, so the crystals will grow on, with uh, uh, a penetrative um, habit. So they, they are essentially forming a, a twinning and uh, this is cruciform twins, uh, which is quite characteristic of staurolite. So we are dealing in this case with some porphyroblasts of, of staurolite, um, which are quite evident. Uh, um, So this could be also considered uh, between a phyllite and a schist uh, because it's still relatively fine grained, although the, uh, the development of uh, fairly um, continuous planes, uh, which are well evident in this case, uh, uh, is, is an indication of, of the fact that we have quite a bit of, of uh, deformation. We are starting to see you know, some domaining in this case. So we would be more closer to a schist in this example, because if you think at the fill light we saw before, uh, 
really we didn't see any major um, development of uh, leukocratic domains versus more mafic domains as we see in this specimen. So I think this really is a transitional moment in which we start to have uh, quite a bit of discontinuity in uh, the cleavage. So we would start to talk about foliation in this example because of the fact that we have uh, some uh, domains that are more uh, represented by quartz and also potentially plagioclase, uh, or actually it could be uh, felspar in general. So I cannot really tell the composition in this case because this is coming from from a pre likely pre-existing sedimentary rock. Uh, so in this case, I, I would say that uh, you know you have levels that are more leucocratic. Uh, so they contain uh, uh, felsic minerals and other levels that are more represented by uh, mafic minerals. Uh, so this is commonly the important transition we observe in metamorphic rocks. So we increase uh, uh, the size of uh, those uh, domains, uh, which are usually M domains, so mafic domains uh, versus uh, more felsic domains in the rock. Um, so this could be classified as a staurolite schist, for example. So remember, when, when we talk about the metamorphic rocks, uh, many times uh, we use uh, uh, relatively simple terminology. The first uh, term, a prefix, is commonly the name of the dominant porphyroblast. Uh, and uh, it could be followed usually by a discussion uh, or, or a term, more correctly, that refers uh, to um, the uh, level of domaining in the rock and uh, the essentially distinction between cleavage and, and schistosity. So when we have schistosity like this, so with this uh, separation, so, so domaining again, we usually call the rock a schist. So we have essentially a term that is a prefix which is related to the mineralogy of the rock followed by a term that discusses the type of structure we can, or texture we can recognize in the rock. So we will apply this also to other rocks. We can see another example here of an even higher grade rock. So you can see how this one shines vividly. And this is because this particular schist is dominated by uh, Muscovite. And so we have essentially a dual mineralogy. So we have these uh, uh, phases that are uh, represented by uh, Muscovite dominantly. And then we have these darker spots um, that again uh, are quite prismatic. If I move uh, the specimen, you can see some of these minerals. Uh, so the mafix in this case. Uh, are quite elongated. And so this one is another good example here. And again, this will be relatively hard. So they are on the order of 7.5. And because of that, you can term these as staurolite as well. So they are not biotite or amphibole in this particular case. Uh, although it will be very challenging if if you have um, to distinguish with, between amphibole and, and these others. The only way is really to look at uh, specific features uh, uh, such as uh, cross twins, which I cannot really observe in this case. Uh, but yeah, in any case, it will be really hard. So if you ask me with respect to hardness, uh, I will tell you, and definitely that is a distinguishing factor between amphibole, which is on the order of five to six, uh, and uh, this other mineral, which is usually on the order of 7.5. Uh, we can still recognize uh, the uh, foliation in this case, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't see clear uh, domaining in this particular rock. So we are a little bit uh, on the finer grain size. So perhaps there is some domaining in this level here, which is looking more sort of light, but this could be product of alteration really. So very difficult to say. Uh, 
in this specimen, but definitely the level of crystallinity in this case, so the grain size and uh, uh, the luster of, of muscovite uh, is uh, put, putting this rock into the schists. So you have to consider really a range of, of features, uh, the irregularity and domaining of, of the cleavage or foliation, and also the level of crystallinity in the rock will help you with the classification. So we could call this uh, a staurolite muscovite schist, for example. So we use the mineralogy we can recognize, start with the porphyroblast, then most abundant mineral in the matrix. And then we, we give it a name based on the interpreted metamorphic grade. What happens if we go even higher? Uh, usually we get coarser, coarser rocks like this. So you can see here, we can almost distinguish individual flakes of uh, muscovite. So you can see the uh, platy habit of some of the muscovite crystals and some of the pseudo hexagonal basals. So the tabular nature of, of the muscovite is quite evident if, if I move it to see, uh, for example, this, this crystal here. Uh, so that's a porphyroblast of uh, uh, muscovite that has grown into uh, a, a matrix and, and has sort of extensively uh, grown. So this will be exceeding, you know, the uh, half centimeter likely. So very coarse size in this rock. So definitely a cyst, and we are moving towards the rocks that are almost neasic in this case. You can see also uh, abundant dark colored minerals. Uh, and in this case, uh, they are fairly rounded. Uh, so they stand out also from, from the overall uh, matrix of the rocks, which is dominated by muscovite. Uh, and they show clearly um, a vitreous luster. If I move it, you can see this particular porphyroblast here, quite dark, rounded. Let's see if I can find another good example. I think this, this one could be a good uh, example here of, or, of a, rel a relatively rounded uh, porphyroblast. Uh, so there will be essentially some garnet uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, specimen for sure. So we have another example here of, of another one of these porphyroblasts. They are essentially porphyroblasts that are fairly rounded. This is even better and uh, brownish. Uh, dark brown, in this case, to black, uh, vitreous luster, really hard, so very difficult to scratch uh, uh, with the carbide tip. So, so in this case, uh, definitely I would uh, uh, refer to these minerals as garnets. Um, so in this case, for the classification of the rock, we would have to look again if we can recognize any foliation and in this case, I can't see the foliation. It's kind of deformed as well. So we have uh, likely also the development of some crenulation in this rock, which because I can recognize some microfolds, uh, uh, which is essentially the uh, fact that you have a phyllosilicates adapting to the shape of some of the porphyroblasts. Uh, um, So in terms of classifying the rock, I, I would uh, still call this uh, a, a garnet and muscovite, muscovite schist, uh, although we are getting to very coarse, uh, coarse uh, sizes of the crystal. So in this context, I think uh, we are very close to a, a neasic texture as well. Uh, but because of the amount of, of phyllosilicates, uh, 
I would be still inclined to call this a schist. And I don't see really a lot of banding. So many times when, when you start to talk about Nyes, you, you have to expect the development of, of uh, banding that is commonly exceeding the centimeter. So you can use that sort of empirical method to distinguish between uh, a schist uh, and a uh, nice. Uh, we are going to look at another example of a cyst here. Uh, this is really dramatically different. We have a very fine grain rock, uh, but it's dominated by a very fibrous mineral, uh, which is also very soft. So you can see I can scratch it very easily. For example, here I could try. It's quite soapy as well if you touch it. Uh, and so many times, if you start from uh, a uh, relatively basic assemblage, so an ultra mafic or a mafic rock, uh, and uh, you increase uh, pressure and temperature, you can get a process called uh, serpentinization. So, in this case, this is an example of a fragment of serpentinite. Uh, and so we will recognize the serpentine often because it's greenish like this. Uh, and it does have a very low hardness, which is usually less, less than three. So if, if I use the copper coin, I will be easily able to scratch, scratch the serpentine. So I have basically some pieces of serpentine left on a copper coin, which indicates that the hardness is less than three. So this is a magnesium rich mineral, which helps you to understand that the origin, so the protolite, so the precursor rock that was metamorphosed was likely particularly rich in magnesium. And so often if we have very soft schists like this, either they contain talc, or uh, serpentine, uh, but serpentine will be characteristically fibrous like this and, and forms all these fibers is very soapy to the touch and very soft. Uh, commonly this is distinguished from another type of, um, another type of uh, um, schist that is ri rich in Philosilicates, and in this case here we have a combination in reality of of minerals. But this schist, is, you can see, is fairly white, uh, very vitreous, uh, so it looks very much like quartz. But the difference is really that uh, still uh, these minerals will will be relatively easy to scratch. So I can I, I made a very deep scratch in this case. So we are even. Uh, lower in terms of hardness if compared to the serpentinite. And that's a good case for talc. So this is an example of, of talc schist. So talc schist will have this kind of a silvery, silvery luster. And many times uh, you find also um, alumosilicates included in, in these rocks. Um, which will give it a, a more fibrous appearance. So you can have kyanite present together with these talc rich schist, and there will be also some, some quartz as well. So many times the alumosilicates will form a very prismatic and fibrous textures. And if I move the rock, you can see they're quite shiny. And they are usually very elongated. So, for example, here I can see definitely an elongated prismatic crystal in here, and they often form a radiated pattern. So you have multiple sort of multiple um, prisms forming, and they they are forming these radial textures. It's a bit difficult to see. If I move it, I think you'll be able to see uh, the different crystals and that have completely different orientations in this rock, uh, which are also sort of helpful in, in the identification of uh, some of the uh, alumosilicates again. So 
So how do we know that this is a schist? Many times, you know, you call it a talc schist because you can still recognize a, a uh, well-defined foliation. In this case, it's still anastomous foliation. It's forming lensoidal domains that contain quite a bit of talc. And then you have probably some quartz as well as uh, these uh, alumosilicates. So I would, be inclined to call this rock a talc silimanite schist based on uh, on the uh, mineralogy I, I can detect in the rock. Usually the talc is a phyllosilicate, so it will form a tabular uh, crystals uh, and uh, instead the alumosilicates will be recognized because they have uh, these prismatic habits uh, uh, which are quite uh, distinctive. Uh, another example of, of these uh, uh, phyllosilicates is in this uh, uh, schist here. Um, so if we look at this one, you have uh, quite a bit of muscovite for sure, uh, but you can see these uh, uh, radiated patterns uh, uh, that uh, sort of illustrate that we have uh, elongated and fibrous crystals uh, that uh, are forming, and this definitely cannot be really the um, the muscovite. Even if this is quite uh, reflective specimens, uh, we can see definitely uh, the evidence of uh, very fibrous uh, textures uh, forming, and they are also radiated as well. You can see here the, the crystals that sort of depart from a central point here, and they grow radially. And so that's definitely one of the distinct distinguishing features when, when you're trying to map uh, and recognize alumosilicates. So they are usually very elongated uh, so form these uh, sometimes even needle-like uh, uh, habits. Uh, together with these, in this case, we have also some staurolite. So you can recognize staurolite, uh, which are the darker elongated and also showing some twinning in this in this case uh, so very hard again so there is essentially a combination of silimanite and staurolite in, in this particular example many times staurolite can be also recognized because it tends to be brownish brown in in color and some of these crystals have a uh, luster that is reddish to brown, which is also helpful for the uh, identification again of, of the uh, staurolite. So in terms of classifying the rock, this would be a staurolite silimanite schist. What happens if we increase the metamorphic grade? Many times we enter into the amphibolite phases. So we will find specimens like this, which look very similar to a, a schist, but they start to have, if you look at the foliation, well-defined uh, domains that are more on the centimeter scale. So you see here a big domain that is all leucocratic represented by quartz, some garnet, and then you have uh, a thick band of uh, mostly amphibole in this rock. So that's a big uh, distinction. Many times in, in uh, uh, Niasic rocks, we will, we will form a clear banding. And so the domaining is, is uh, occurring at at a larger scale, basically, which is becoming centimeter scale instead of millimeter scale as seen, as seen in earlier specimen of, of cysts. So in terms of the mineralogy here, we definitely recognize uh, the presence of garnet. Uh, you can see here uh, a section to a garnet, which is uh, characteristically dark red. And you can see the uh, habit, uh, so uh, a dodecahedron likely, and, and uh, the, it's very hard again, so easy to recognize uh, with uh, uh, the an test. Uh, we have also quite a bit of 
uh, biotite in this uh, in this case uh, you can see some plug of, of biotite as well so if if i try to scratch uh, the biotite many times it's very easy see i, I can easily pulverize uh, a plug of biotite uh, instead amphibole would be much more difficult to um, to scratch another garnet here quite clearly so there is a combination of of minerals really uh, probably that's that's an amphibole let's see if if i can uh, easily scratch it or not and yeah it's very hard so so very difficult really to scratch it uh, so you have a combination in this case of amphibole and uh, uh, and biotite uh, and garnet. So we could call this uh, again a, a garnet nice, for example, or garnetiferous nice, uh, or a garnet uh, biotite nice because of this uh, characteristic domaining we can we can recognize. So you can see here, for example, a large porphyroblast and. and uh, some of the leucocratic material that is forming in uh, what is called the pressure shadow that is developed uh, in this uh, foliated rock. Uh, so this is becoming you know, more discontinuous uh, uh, foliation and there is significant domaining. So we are really in a rock that is close uh, to a nice uh, uh, because also of the coarser, coarser grain size of, of some of the minerals. Uh, even more distinctive would be a uh, rock that is had a uh, granitic uh, composition as a protolite and we look at uh, you know understanding how uh, the metamorphism would change uh, such a granitic rock so we will de develop uh, again uh, a foliation but uh, in this case uh, it's becoming bonding because we can see quite clearly the existence of, of a more mafic domain in which we have uh, dominantly mafic minerals, which will be likely amphibole as well as biotite could be present. And then we have the pinkish K felspar, which you should be able to recognize easily now. And then we move into another domain that uh, is uh, again re represented by mafic minerals. So, so in this example, is the bonding really that helps us uh, distinguishing uh, a schist from a nice? So I would call this rock a uh, nice. And in particular, we could use a prefix that refers to the protolith. So if we have a granitic uh, rock, quite commonly, we call it an ortho nice because ortho refers to a granitic protolith. Instead, if uh, it's uh, a nice that is formed like before from, from a, a, a sedimentary rock, we will call it a paranice. So this is an example of an orthonice. Another example of, of an orthonice is this one here. So it's, it's again a more, you know, mafic, um, intrusive rock that has been deformed uh, and you can recognize the deformation because you can see an iso orientation of the mafic minerals. Uh, so in this case, the amphibole is forming a, uh, uh, a lineation. So in this case, we, we will call it lineation because we have not really formed a well-defined planes in this case. Uh, we don't have enough phyllosilicates uh, to form a clear foliation. So oftentimes uh, when we deal with uh, neasic rocks, uh, we can recognize early defoliation. If we don't have enough uh, clays in, in the rock uh, uh, or uh, if we don't have enough uh, uh, pre-existing phyllosilicates such as muscovite and biotite. So if we look at a uh, orthogonal section to through the uh, this particular nice, we can see that we don't have really uh, a fabric in the rock that is 
indicative of a set of planes, uh, we, ra we rather have that all the um, amphibos have been reoriented in a similar fashion, uh, but they are forming more likely a lineation as a result of that. So we've talked about the lineations uh, during the lecture time. So you should know the difference between lineation and foliation. But yeah, in, in essence, uh, a lineation will be uh, represented by a set of pencils uh, that exit uh, this section of the rock. So you have to imagine that my pencil is representative of a single amphibole mineral. So you have a lot of amphibole minerals distributed on, on this surface, uh, and they are all sticking out, basically. And so that's your lineation. Instead, if you have a foliation, you would have a set of planar features that go through this rock, uh, which would be planes uh, in which you have uh, is-oriented all the phyllosilicates. The last rock we review in terms of nice is the characteristic um, Ogen nice. So Ogen is a term that describes the existence of large uh, porphyroblasts. And many times you find you find these uh, eyes uh, because Ogen refers to eyes uh, in the rock. And so you have it's fairly coarse texture again. Uh, we have some foliation that we can recognize in, in this rock, but it's very irregular. And uh, also the domaining is quite significant. Uh, so this is why we call this still a nice, uh, but also the fact that you have this large porphyroblast uh, of uh, uh, Felspar in this case, because you can see some cleavage in, in some of these uh, eyes uh, and uh, Yes, the fact that you have foliation wrapping around the uh, porphyroblast is also an important observation that indicates that this is a metamorphic rock uh, rather than a igneous rock. Uh, and also the fact that uh, you see uh, the pressure solution has uh, formed an, an ellipsoidal geometry or section for these porphyroblasts. So they get squeezed by high pressures and generally you tend to dissolve material on this part and re-precipitate in a pressure shadow domain many times, which is on the edges. So you get elongated crystals uh, as a result of the compaction and, and deformation that really takes place at high pressures uh, in, uh, in the ASIC assemblages. Uh, so this was likely a rock that uh, was granitic in composition. So it could be, you know, a granodiorite, for example, or a diorite. Uh, and uh, you have uh, then a phase of deformation and, and increasing temperature, which leads to recrystallization and significant domaining. If you look carefully, you can see some planes that are dominated by mafic minerals and others that will be more felsic. Uh, and some of the felsic we, will include. Uh, quite a bit of, of uh, plagio clays. Uh, so again, rocks like this, when, when you have these characteristic eyes forming, will be called augen nice because of that. If we increase even uh, further the grade, Many times we end up deforming pre-existing geometries. So we look at this example here, um, which is a bit big specimen, so difficult to, to really put it in uh, context. But many times, um, many times when when we increase really a lot of the deformation, and we have also some melting that occurs uh, in in rocks like of this type. Uh, we end up moving into what are called migmatitic nice or uh, migmatites. So these will be rocks that are very close to uh, partial melting. And in fact, some, some of these material you see here, which I can illustrate as pinkish to reddish, uh, 
is actually heavily strained and deformed at K fast bar. And these are K fast bar veins that have formed uh, quite a bit of folding. So they are uh, commonly called stigmatic folds, um, very irregular, really deformation features that, that we can recognize in heavily strained rocks like these. Uh, and some of these are fast bar veins. So they indicate that you had quite a bit of partial melting of a pre-existing uh, um, igneous or plutonic rock. And often accompanied with that, we have a, a significant separation of uh, leucocratic materials, which like which is this fast bar, which is commonly called the leucosome versus more darker uh, intervals. So we have very large bands in this specimen. So if I move it, you will recognize here a very large uh, band represented by uh, mafic minerals, which is in this light, it will be likely uh, either amphibole or pyroxene, but most likely it will be amphibole because of the facic composition of this of this rock. So, um, so migmatites many times are distinguished because you, you can recognize the evidence of the intensity of the formation. So the occurrence of this uh, characteristic uh, uh, isoclinal folds. Uh, so many times uh, we call uh, folds isoclinal when the, uh, the fold is essentially having uh, that both limbs have pretty much a, a consistent angle, so they become parallel. So these would be the limbs of a pre-existing fold that has been tightened significantly. Um, many times uh, the strain is so high that we also call uh, these folds uh, um, rootless fold because you, you basically lose uh, really the limbs, so they get strained heavily. And uh, also that is a good indication of, of the amount of, of shearing that has occurred in the rock. Um, in this other part, we can see some other layers uh, and uh, you can see this likely were original uh, porphyroblasts. Uh, and, and so you, you end up in a situation where the dissolution is uh, forming really a redistribution of the fast bar and it's forming uh, also budens because of the strain, which you, has, you have essentially a thinning, significant thinning in certain portion and thickening in others, uh, which is again, another indication of the high amount of strain in the rock. So this is really the highest grade we are going to look at in uh, uh, this lab. So whenever you find a rock that has this intensity of deformation, the formation of, of these very regular folds uh, and uh, also heavily strained uh, porphyroblasts like this example here, which is better than the one we were showing before. Uh, those are good indication that we are dealing with the, a migmatite together with the fact that, that we have a very extensive bonding in this rock. So, so far we have looked at rocks that are mostly foliated rocks. So in a general sense, we have two major groups of metamorphic rocks. One group is the one we just reviewed, which is represented by foliated or rocks that have a significant cleavage. But there will be a case of metamorphic rocks that has no foliation. And this is the group we are going to review now. We just left with a few specimens, really. These are commonly uh, derived by a type of metamorphism that is different from, from the previous specimens and it lack essentially an increase in pressure. So most of the foliation and reorganization of minerals we find in foliated rocks is often linked to an increase in pressure because you need pressure to form those anisotropies in the rock. If we have an isotropic rock, so a rock that doesn't show any foliation, Many times we refer to those rocks as formed in a condition of contact metamorphism. So you must remember that from the lecture, we talked about contact metamorphism, which is usually 
a temp temperature increase uh, related process. So you, you have, for example, an intrusive rock that is entering into a carbonate massive and is completely metasomatizing and, and recrystallizing a complex of, of uh, uh, sedimentary rocks that are represented by uh, dolomite or carbonite assemblages. So what happens if, if you have uh, these magmas interacting with the calcites and dolomites? Uh, well, often that uh, results in uh, intense recrystallization, but you don't form foliation for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you don't have the pressure as mentioned. Uh, so you have a relatively low pressure gradients. Uh, and so you don't push or squeeze the rock to form the foliation, but at the same time, you also lack a significant amount of clays in many instances, not always, but in, in some cases you will have rocks that are dominated by calcite. And so you don't have the phyllosilicates, which have a tabular habit that will form the foliation. So what is the result of this discussion? Quite commonly, it will be rocks that have this appearance. So they will be essentially dominated by calcite, which can be identified if we use a bit of acid, you will see an intense fizzing. And in this case is really vivid as you see a very large bubble, which indicates that we have a really almost 100% of calcite in this rock. Uh, you can also recognize it if, if you try to scratch it, because as you see, I, I can generate quite easily scratches because we are under the tree for the calcite, so 2.5 and uh, reaction to acid. So can you see any foliation in a rock like this? It looks as the crystals that are very coarse because they exceed the half millimeter uh, for sure. Or, or even in some case, the half centimeter, I would say. So like this crystal here is very large. And I can definitely recognize many crystals and they look like they are scattered in uh, this matrix. Uh, and so this looks like a, a very coarse cement to me, which often is a, a good indication that this is a metamorphic rock and this is dominantly uh, represented by calcite. So what do we call a rock like this? Many times we call it a marble. So marbles will have this very sugary texture in, in most cases. Uh, uh, we can see another example uh, just to clarify. Sometimes they will be very crystalline, like uh, this example here is more fine grained, uh, but uh, you can, if I move the rock, you can still see the crystallinity quite, quite a bit, especially on this on this side here. So still looking very crystalline. So a lot of um, crystals here showing uh, uh, quite a bit of reflectivity and uh, uh, they have uh, uh, vitreous luster again, uh, very soft uh, so I can scratch them easily and they will react to acid as well. So in, you see how pure is the appearance of this rock dominated by really by a single mineral. And again, a, a good example of a marble in this case. So what happens if we have some clay materials in, in the rock? Well, many times we form what are called calc silicates. So you still have these really uh, unordered, I would say, or non-foliated uh, sugary texture, which is well evident. Uh, but we start to form minerals that we have also uh, in here. So these darker examples here, so more mafic minerals uh, that result from the recrystallization of this, uh, likely uh, this was a sedimentary rock because you can still recognize some of the pre-existing bedding. But yeah, you don't see really um, a lot of foliation in a rock like this. Uh, it's, it's quite still an order, especially in this uh, internal domain. And we, we do see uh, 
uh, characteristic greenish minerals in here, which again are calcium rich minerals. So if you remember, we talked about uh, the uh, presence of uh, uh, diopside in, in some of the contact metamorphism rocks during the lab lecture. So you can recognize uh, the existence of uh, uh, pyroxene basically in some of these rocks, which indicates uh, the existence of uh, silica. And so the fact that uh, not all the rock reacts, uh, for example, if we test this crystal here, I can tell you that if I use the acid, it will not fizz. So no fizzing indicates that this is a silicate likely. And so we have you know, evidence of some porphyroblasts that have silicate in them, they are greenish, olive green in many cases will, will help you with the, the identification of uh, phases that are likely to be diopside. And then here you have also other darker pyroxene present as well. Uh, which is again an indication that this is a rock that contains uh, a percentage of calcite that is definitely lower if, if compared with the previous marble specimens. So, and so commonly when you have a mixture of clay material and carbonate in a rock and you, and you use contact metamorphism to change the mineralogy, the result would be very similar to this specimen and commonly we refer to these as either impure marbles or calc silicates. The last rock that we uh, review in this lab is a rock that is kind of similar to a marble in appearance. So you will be very careful when you're assessing rock like this because you still see that there is no foliation at all. Uh, but the rock is somewhat uh, uh, distinguished uh, based on uh, uh, the identification of the mineralogy in this case. Uh, so if I use the acid here, I will see that nothing is really fizzing. And so many times when, when the rock doesn't fizz and it's very hard, so difficult to, to scratch it, uh, well, it's quite vitreous, uh, you can see a lot of tiny crystals shining in, in this example. Uh, we commonly recognize this mineral as quartz. So instead of calling the rock a marble, we commonly refer to it as a quartzite. So you can imagine that this was originally a well-sorted and also a monomineralic uh, a rock which is dominated by quartz grains, basically. And so through compaction, diagenesis, uh, we end up forming a rock that commonly represents represented by a quartzite, so a quartz rich uh, assemblage uh, that has been uh, recrystallized. The result of recrystallization, as we saw in the lectures, uh, is commonly that we uh, change the morphology of the crystal, so we lose the roundness, so they, they become more uh, intertwined and uh, usually they, they, grow, they grow in size, so you get larger crystals of quartz. Uh, so if you cut a thin section and you look at it at the mic a microscope, uh, many times to recognize the difference is also to look for triple junctions uh, in quartz grains, uh, so they, the, the way in which they are packed together will change in response to the level of compaction. And again, the increase in pressure and temperature that uh, leads to the formation of a quartzite. So this was the last specimen uh, that uh, will be considered for examinations really. So hopefully you had a good, uh, um, tour of, of the different metamorphic specimens. Uh, remember again, in terms of sum, summarizing this uh, tour, uh, we have two major groups of metamorphic rocks, uh, the foliated rocks, which we saw in the first part of the lab, and also the non-foliated rocks, which are essentially marbles, uh, or for example, the calc silicates, uh, or this last example, the quartzite. So these two major groups, uh, 
Within the first group, remember that we use grain size, level of crystallinity, and also the existence of cleavage, foliation, and bonding to distinguish the different uh, rocks uh, into mainly uh, slates, fillites, and then we move into uh, the schists and gneiss uh, to conclude then with the migmatites, which are very highly strained rocks, uh, which have also evidence of partial melting. So those feldspar veins uh, are quite quite instructive, I think, about the bonding and the distribution that we observed in, in one of the highly strained specimens that uh, I presented. So all these are really the result of different pressure and, and temperature again, which will affect the reorganization of the minerals and also the formation of new minerals. So if you find very large Minerals, remember, we call them porphyroblasts, and we can have, again, different compositions, mostly staurolites. We saw silimonite, and we saw also some large porphyroblasts of muscovite, for example, and also some serpentine, uh, so the soft one. So hopefully you had a good, good sort of overview of this lab uh, and uh, it will sort of help you with uh, the identification of the different metamorphic rocks.